We are going to be talking about packing S&S coupled bikes in this Co-Motion Co-Pilot case. There are hard cases out there, which I don't recommend because packing in a hard case is much more challenging. I think it's not as good for the bike. The chances of something bad happening to the bike are greater. And the weight of the bike and the whole case together is lighter with a soft sided case. Now I should mention that I've packed many, many bikes. I've worked with a very large number of people on specking SNS coupled bikes and packing them. A lot of what I'm sharing with you today is straight from personal experience with me traveling with my own bike and also customers who I've worked with who have traveled with their bikes. Now that there are a lot of components offered that are more optimal for travel, there's just so many good ways of making your bike perfect to travel with. Optimization, what to choose for your bike. It doesn't make anything right or wrong. You can pack almost any SNS coupled bike of almost any size as well. You can get up to a very large, like 67 centimeter frame, effective top two length, in one of these cases. Should also mention the Co-Motion Co-Pilot case measures under the TSA limit for an oversized bag. So it checks as a regular suitcase and it's got wheels on it, it's easy to deal with. That means that it's not being charged as an oversized bag, but there's other benefits to it, such as being able to fit you, your other luggage, possibly a travel partner in a tiny taxi cab or a family member's car, just a regular sedan. So it makes travel easier getting through trains and definitely thinking about European travels significantly easier as well as US situations where a large bike case is going to be so much harder to travel with. So that's one really good reason a lot of people choose to get their bikes SNS coupled. Which wheels to choose for the bike? There's rim brake wheels and obviously bikes that are made for rim brake wheels and disc wheels. The considerations to think about if you have a disc brake bike are if you have wheels that take six bolt rotors. This requires putting six bolts into the rotor to put it on the wheel and removing. Lots of potential problems with this. Anytime you're dealing with a bolt, especially the tiny bolts that go in this, they're easy to strip and that can cause a lot of trouble if you can't get your rotors off. And you will see in the packing, you want to take your rotors off of your wheels. And then the center lock is a much simpler rotor to take off of the wheels. Rim brake wheels, everything is simple with those. If something were to happen to the brake track in travel, like uh, they get hit or something like that and the wheel's a little untrue, it's a lot harder to brake. So disc wheels, if they go out of true, you're still gonna be able to ride the wheel generally just fine. It's not going to mess up your trip or anything like that. I've seen very few wheels damaged in travel, so it's not something to worry too much about. And then if you're choosing between aluminum and carbon, I would suggest traveling with aluminum wheels because any damage that would happen to an aluminum wheel typically doesn't compromise the wheel, but it would compromise a carbon wheel if something were to happen to it. A common question is tubeless versus tubes. Tubeless is becoming much more popular now, but tubeless is harder to travel with. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with tubeless. It's important for you to be aware of what tubeless is all about, to be comfortable with it at home if you're going to travel with a tubeless setup. Most wheels nowadays are tubeless ready. So you could have a tubeless ready wheel, but install tubes in your tires. Tubes are easy to find anywhere in the world. You can travel with them, they can be patched, and you don't have the risk of getting tubeless sealant all over everything in your case if the bead were to break during travel and then sealant everywhere is not a lot of fun. Don't make this the first time you're experiencing tubeless while you're traveling. Back to the wheels I was talking about, rim versus disc. There's more decisions to be made surrounding disc brakes, if it's cable actuated disc or hydraulic disc brakes. There are quite a few hydraulic disc brake bikes in the world. 
they work really well. But think about this, if something were to happen to the hydraulic housing, if there's a pinch or something that would compromise your brake, would that ruin your trip? If the answer is yes, then I highly recommend going with cable actuated disc brakes. We have two bikes back here. This one is hydraulic. I'll go through the differences on that and how you pack that. There are safe ways of doing it. So it can be handled with care and it could be a situation that you trust just fine. I don't recommend internally routed disc hydraulic housing. If it's internally routed in the frame, there are a lot more pinch points. Anywhere the housing is going in the frame, it's an area that could be compromised. It would just make it easier for something bad to happen to that housing. It's just a lot of things that could go wrong and not having a break working on your vacation is probably not ideal. There are some couplers in the world that couple a hydraulic housing. It's one more thing to have bad things happen to. So just keep it simple. This bike over here that has the hydraulic brake, has the housing on the outside of the frame. It's easier to get at. It's also easier to wrap it up and tuck it away, keep it safe. The cable actuated disc brakes, I use that on my bike. I use Grotac Equal brakes. They're really strong, really nice, easy to adjust. Cable actuated disc brakes work well and offer all the brake power that you need and you can adjust it and you never have to worry about the hydraulic fluid, possibly needing a brake bleed or having the hydraulic fluid spill out if something were to happen with that hydraulic housing. Shifting systems. Well, this is a biggie. There's been a lot of innovation in shifting between electronics on the Shimano side and the SRAM side. SRAM has completely wireless shifting. Personally, that's what I've chosen to put on my bike for ease of not having any cables for shifting. It's less to go wrong. It's less to have to adjust and deal with, and it's easy. It's easy to have extra batteries with that system. So I find that that works really well with my optimized travel situation. Shimano has DI2 electronics shifting, which involves wires that run into the frame. These wires are easy to split apart and there's a junction box in the down tube for the 11 speed DI2 that allows for easy decoupling of the wires but those are wires that could be potentially severed in travel. The bike is going to be a pile of bike in the case, so things can happen to wires. There's just more cables that have to be coupled. This is what the cable coupler looks like. And if you have mechanical shifting, you've got one of these for both front derailleur and rear derailleur, if you have a front derailleur. And that allows you to attach the cables and then you don't have to cut the cables off the bike. These are just finger tight when you put it together. I mean, it needs to be properly tight, but there's just more of those on the outside of the bike if you have mechanical shifting. DI2 is now 12 speed and partially wireless. That means there's no wires from the front end of the bike running through the down tube to the rear of the bike. So there's still some wires, but there are fewer wires. I highly recommend if you're going to be traveling soon to do a full packing and unpacking session about two weeks prior to travel. You want to do it exactly the way you're going to do this when you travel. If you touch a tool, plan to take that tool with you. Pack with the exact same tools you're planning on traveling with. For example, long handled tools. These are so much easier to use than a multi-tool. One of these is great to travel with if it's in your saddlebag and not what you're going to be using for packing your bike. Long handled tools come in handy for a lot of different things. And one of them is leverage, getting pedals on and off and that sort of thing. You want to take photos of what you do so you remember what you did. When you're traveling, you are tired you jet lagged possibly. You could be really stressed out from just the nature of the trip. So you don't want to have to think about it. You want this to be automatic and you want to have really good notes for yourself. So you're not relying on a lot of thinking power to get your bike back together and to get it to be safe so that you can go and just ride it. SNS is a company that builds the couplers and you see how many threads are on there. This 
just screws on and it tightens many times. So that makes a strong juncture. This is welded on to the top tube and welded onto the down tube. There's nothing about having an SNS coupled bike that means you have to have any specific tire sizes or like there's nothing about the bike that has to change because these are on there. The bike will be a half a pound heavier if your bike has two of these. That's the difference in what you would feel is simply the bike would be a little bit heavier. It's very stiff. These are very quiet. You will never know these are on your bike. Imperceptible. I'm gonna jump into starting to pack the bike. You can choose the order of operations you want. Do what makes you most comfortable. I'm going to tell you how I like to do it, and then you can adopt whichever principles, practices you want for yourself. I always begin with the things that involve leverage that really helps when the bike is together. The first thing, I take it off of this, because this is mostly cheap. Don't do it on a stand at home because when you're in a hotel room, you're gonna have a bed to lean your bike against, maybe a wall, and you might even have some beige carpet that you have to deal with. First thing, I get the bike into the small chain ring, if we've got two chain rings, and the small cog in the rear. Those are the positions the front and rear really should be in. But first, small and small. Then, pedals can be difficult to remove. There are a variety of different ways of getting them off of there. Look in the back of your pedal, see if it's got a hole in it. If it does, hopefully it takes a hex wrench to remove it. Many of them now are eights. If you need a pedal wrench, you could travel with this, or you could travel with something much smaller. This is part of what you're going to learn when you're practicing, is what tools do you need to go to the store and buy and have ready for you. When you're taking a pedal off, you pull it back, so away from the direction you're pedaling, because both spindles are made to tighten when you pedal, meaning when you go the opposite direction, they will loosen. And you'll figure out what works best in terms of how your bike is oriented. You wanna keep everything together in the same place because you don't wanna put something over there on a counter and you're gonna be packing and then all of a sudden you're gonna leave and discover you left something really important at home. Now, while the bike is still together, the next thing I wanna do is loosen, but not take apart the couplers. It depends on how the bike is made as to which way you spin the couplers. In this case, when I push down, that is loosening. So I'm just gonna loosen it a little bit. I'm also going to disconnect the rear brake cable. Now this is because I have the cable actuated disc brakes that this is an option. See, this bike has zip tie guides. So what I would do is, I would take my very handy and super professional fingernail clippers and clip the zip ties all the way down so that I can remove the rear brake caliper and then I'm going to bundle it nicely in a towel so that it stays with the handlebars. This is specific to a hydraulic brake system. I've loosened the couplers. I'll be able to get those loose later when I'm ready for that step. My bike, I'm an electronic bike with the SRAM Axis E-Tap, so I'm taking the battery out, putting that with my pedals, and good practice is to put on the red door that comes with the bike so that we know there's no battery in there. I'm gonna take the saddle and the seat post out of here. If you haven't done already, you wanna mark your seat post. You don't wanna to have to think about where that goes back. You wanna get it just right. Mine's already marked. So I'm gonna get this out of here. Okay. If you had a DI2 bike, when you pull your seat post out, you're gonna have a battery that has wires sticking out. So you want to be careful of those wires. You don't want to just yank the seat post out like I just did. You would take your DI2 tool 
and you would gently disconnect the wires from the battery and you would tuck the wires right inside your seat tube. They're not gonna go very far, but if you're worried about that, you could tape them in there. The bike is starting to come apart. Now at this point, everything is disconnected that needs to disconnect. If you had had mechanical shifters, you would have undone all of the cables associated with them. I'm going to take the wheels off. So it's nice to start with the front wheel and you've got the fork to set the bike down on. And best practice, put that through axle, if you have a through axle, right back in the, the bike. If you have a quick release bike, you don't have to worry about doing that. The quick release will come off with the wheel and you will remove the quick release from the wheel and put that in your pile of parts. Through axles are really hard to find at bike shops and there's a lot of different standards. So don't expect if you've forgotten your through axles, you're probably gonna have trouble replacing them. And do the rear wheel as well while we're here. This is something that's good to practice just in general in terms of what you do to get your rear wheel off. If you've got a clutch derailleur, like this one, this round has a nice button here. You have to look at it, it has a little lock symbol on it. You do that, and that keeps the derailleur so that it makes the chain tension is not on the chain, so it makes it a lot easier to take that wheel out of there. And there you go. You want to be careful when you take these wheels out. You don't want to lean them on the rotors and you don't want to touch the rotors with your fingers. Now I'm putting this through axle right back in the bike. So if you have hydraulic disc brakes, you're going to take these plastic pieces that come with your disc brakes. You're going to put those in both the front and rear calipers to keep the pads from closing because there's lots of reasons why you might accidentally hit the lever. If you do hit the lever, it's not a bad idea to travel with a flathead screwdriver. The biggest one that you can, it's clean, you would just put it in between the brake pads and twist it gently and those pads will open back up again and your problem solved. Cable actuated disc brakes, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so now I'm at the position where I can take the bike apart. Again, if you're an 11-speed DIT bike, you will have wires inside the tubes that you have to be careful with. When you decouple the frame, you'll want to split those wires. With the rear derailleur, this always comes off the bike, and it's almost always a five millimeter wrench that you use to remove the rear derailleur. So you just counterclockwise, spin that off. With the exception of the pedals, every bolt on a bike, when you spin it counterclockwise, it loosens the bolt. Clockwise will tighten the bolt. Now we have the rear of the bike together and ready to go. Now the front of the bike. Some people have tall head tubes to the point where the fork and the head tube might need to be separated. This head tube is is small, but if yours were to be tall, then if the bike, if that, that is not gonna fit the diagonal proportion of the case, then you have to take the fork out of the head tube to get it to fit into the case. So just be aware that if the bike is bigger, you might have to do that. How you remove the handlebars from the stem. There's two different ways of doing this. I used to always remove the stem from the steerer tube using these pinch bolts and removing the, the five millimeter bolt that comes down holding on the top cap. But I found it's easier to pack if you remove the faceplate. You may have an opinion on this and what you like. If you remove the stem, your headset might end up in pieces. If you take this off, be careful to keep the headset together. And if you're going to take the headset off, you want your very handy removable zip ties. These things are pretty awesome. And I think you could probably get that at Home Depot. Just buy a lot of these, because they're good for everything. Before you loosen the bolts, you make a mark to where the stem is bolted together or some mark so you know where you want to put it back. My stem takes 
a Torx T25 wrench to remove these bolts. Many stem bolts are T25 and others are fours. You want to make sure you're using the right ones. Do this in good light so you're not getting it wrong. If you get it wrong, you'll strip the bolt and then you're never going to get your stem off. My handlebars are no longer attached to the stem. And I've got a zip tie attaching the housing to the fork. I'm gonna try to leave this on, but I may need to remove it. We will see how far we get with that. Now, on the wheels, you'll leave the cassette on. There's no requirement as to how much air you have in your tires. I've never ever heard of a tire blowing out because of airline travel, especially at the lower pressures that people are running now. You'll generally take air out just to fit your wheels in the case and make everything fit. Having a little air in there too protects the wheels. If you can keep some air in there, that's great. But these wheels are set up tubelessly right now, and this is not the way I would travel with them. Because right now I've got sealant gumming up the valve core that's causing problems. And I would prefer not to have to deal with that. And it's going to be hard to get air back in here because the sealant is gumming up the valve core. So I would travel with additional valve cores because of that potential issue. Okay, so I'm going to let this out, some air out, and then I'm going to take the rotors off. There's two different types of center lock rotor lock rings. This lock ring requires a Shimano bottom bracket tool to remove it. The other lock ring type looks just like the lock ring that you would use to secure a Shimano cassette on your wheel. That tool would look something like this or one of these that you would travel with a crescent wrench in order to use. You're gonna have one or the other of these kinds of lock rings it's not a bad idea to put the lock rings right back on. Oh, look at this. We got sealant coming out, the valve stone. This is just the wonderful mess that I was hoping to avoid, but that is the life of tubeless. Given more time, I would put the space plate of the stem back with the bolts. Otherwise, I'm gonna put that in a bag and keep that together. I'm gonna remove the rear rotor. And then with the rotors you wanna put on a clean towel or shop rag, something that is clean. You want to keep the rotors from touching each other and you want to keep them from getting bent or dirty. If hydraulic fluid were to get on them, that would be terrible. You would have a very hard time breaking. It would be loud and noisy, not a lot of fun. I like to put those together in a little sandwich. I take electrical tape and wrap the package and I will usually put the rotors in with my clothes, in my check baggage with, with my pair of clothes. If I don't have another case, if I'm not checking any other bags, then I would put it between cardboard and stick it in with the bike. My bike with the case and everything in it, it's about 42 pounds. So that's about eight pounds shy of the 50 pound limit. So a really big bike might be 44 pounds, depending on what it's made out of. The tools and that sort of thing, I'll usually travel with elsewhere, not in with the bike. And tools can also do some damage if they're moving around in there. Okay, the bike in pieces. These are made by s, &S. This is really nice, thick, sturdy packing. This material will keep a cassette from damaging painted tubes. Now, I don't recommend painting a bike that's going to be traveled with just because it's going to stress you out. And if you get a scratch on your bike when you're traveling, if that's going to make you sad and ruin your trip, it's not worth painting your bike. But there are ways of putting paint on a bike where the padding will protect it. And if you're careful, you can be just totally fine. Let me show. Quick example. Each of these you cut to length and then wrap all parts of the bike. So I'm going to wrap the seat post, keep it from getting scratched. Wrap the top tube and keep it from getting scratched. And there's different widths. So you would want one roll of the shorter width and one roll of the larger width. Just cut those to length and then label them so you know where they go back to on the frame. So like top tube, down tube, those sorts of things. 
It's also a good exercise in knowing the parts of the bike. You can also use pipe for insulation if you don't want to use these pads. Just whatever you use, definitely suggest not using bubble wrap because there's going to be so much movement with the bike. Most anything's gonna cut right through this and then scratch your bike. I guess that's gonna cut through almost anything. It's like a bunch of little knives in there. You wrap up all the bike. Obviously I'm not doing it now because of time. And then you put the bike in the case. Now, every single person's bike packs differently. So there is no one right way to do this. So what it just is, practice. Don't worry about it until you figure out what you like and then you want to take pictures of it. So imagine this bike is all wrapped up and protected so that what I'm doing right now, obviously is something I would not do with your bike, I would just do this with my bike. Then the cassette, you can have it pointed any which way you want. And figure out the best way of making it fit. Right now, we're saying like my down two and the cassette are probably going to interface. I'm gonna try doing this set up. And don't hesitate to wrap your handlebars through the spokes of the wheel so as to fit. Like that works really well. And then when you get it to where you want it, you look to see what might rub and then put towels or this protective material in between those areas. And then you take your trusty's removable zip ties and you attach things to each other so it can't move. TSA is going to open your bike. They're gonna look in it. They're just gonna look in there to see that there isn't any contraband in the case. So as long as you have everything all connected together, then you're not gonna have anything get lost out of the case. That's really important. And again, you play with it, kind of play with it. You're not gonna break anything. So now, let's see where this fits. The rear of the bike is really high. So you wanna find the place in the case where it can be lower, where here there's just the wheel, there's not the fork and everything else going on. So there's more room for something that's high. And the crank, this is nice. This is a one by setup here. I chose one by for this bike because of optimizing bike for travel and it's really optimal for gravel bike riding as well. So a lot more people who are road riding with one bike. Okay. We're looking we're looking pretty good. You have that all together. So you go. Don't worry you can make the bike fit in there. No, it's just no problem. And I still have a fair amount of air in those tires. Now it is ready to go. That's how it goes. It's not, it's not too onerous. Now, when you open it up, now you're going to take out your camera. You're going to take pictures of each layer as you remove it so that you remember how to put it back when you're tired. So now we're gonna put the bike back together. If you've made a nice list of what you did, now you're just gonna reverse order everything. Go from the bottom up and your bike will come back together. It's important to use a torque wrench and you want to torque each bolt to torque spec for safety so that you're getting the bolts on there properly tight and not overly tight. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna take you through every bolt on this bike, but I'm going to talk you through the important nuances and then you get the idea of what should happen. So the rear derailleur is not hard to put back, but it's intimidating to people. So you want to pay attention to how it was set up when you had it on the bike. I did a number, okay, this is a good example. I let the rear derailleur come through and now the chain is on the wrong side of the bike. All right, so just think through it. You know it works. You know you haven't changed the chain. You haven't changed the orientation. So you know it will work. Go in with a positive attitude on 
Everything will come back together as you expect it to go back together. There's a little notch on your derailleur hanger. The derailleur is going to need to sit down on that. So this is a good one to take a look at before you undo the derailleur to make sure you understand how it goes back together and how it should look. This is hard to describe for the camera. You never want to force feed any bolt. So if it feels like the bolt is fighting you and being reattached, stop. This, you want to make sure that this is directly perpendicular. So these are really flush, these two surfaces. And then when that spins freely, you know the threads are properly aligned. And then you tighten it. And then the driller drops down and hits that little shelf on there. And then you tighten that with your torque wrench. A torque wrench that I really like is this nice little case from Silka. This is their torque wrench. Easy for anyone to use. There's other small tools that are easy to travel with that give you a torque setting. So you know you're tightening to the right amount of pressure. I'm going to reattach the handlebars, look to see how things are. I want to make sure nothing is twisted oddly. If something looks weird, it's probably not right because you don't want any twisting there. When you put the stem bolts back on the stem, there's four bolts. You want to tighten the bolts evenly. If you over tighten one bolt, the others will not tighten down appropriately. And you'll notice once you've gotten everything to where you think it's tight, if you go back to the other bolts, they'll feel loose. You want these to be tightened at even increments to the torque setting. I'm just gonna do this enough to get this on here. This is for the sake of demonstration. The bars are where they need to be. Now, getting the frame back together. And you can use the case as a nice floor because you don't wanna get grease all over your hotel room. So you can put the crank set and everything that's greasy in the case and even step in it. I'm not gonna do that here, but that's something I suggest doing. What you'll find is those sometimes don't look like they're gonna be exactly lined up. Take both of your hands and take the couplers, hold them together, and just try to catch that first thread of the coupler. So get those lined up. I'm using my legs to steady the rear of the bike and just trying to get that first coupler thread caught in there on both of them. The way the teeth are on these couplers, they're gonna be lined up. They won't let you do it incorrectly. According to SNS, one should check the tightness of the coupler. I believe it's once a ride. So sure, you can do that. They stay tight for quite a long time if you've got them properly tight and use the wrench to do this. Usually what I'll do is go through, put the bike together loosely, and then go back and check every single bolt from the front of the bike to the rear of the bike, making sure if you see a bolt, you touch it with the wrench to make sure it's properly tight. This is when the bike is all together. That's what ensures the bike will be safe to ride because you know, you're doing this, you're tired. You might not have gotten everything just right. And with the bike's like this, I cannot tell you that there's any way that I just tighten those couplers the way I need to, the way I will when the wheels are on the bike and when the tires have air in them. Speaking of tires with air in them, really handy to have the travel pump. I suggest this nice Lazine one. It's a floor pump so you can step on it and air up your tires very easily. There's a number of floor pumps that are small and easy to travel with. And none of these pumps, from my experience, has a good gauge on it. Just a little electronic gauge for tire pressure, especially if tire pressure matters to so you, you can't figure it out by the hand test, which most people can't. Use a little electronic gauge to figure that out. I'll tell you more about reassembling the rotors. Bikes have different size front and rear rotors. So like this bike has a 160 front and 140 rear rotor. That's the diameter of the rotor. I recommend if it's a 
bike optimized for travel, just get 160, 160. 160s are really easy to find in the world. And then if something bad were to happen to one of your rotors, you can put it in either position that you want to use it and you will have a rotor. When you take the rotors off, it's a good idea to, in the back of the rotor, right with the Sharpie, if it's a front rotor or rear rotor, so that you put it on in the same location. Because rotors wear slightly differently and that will help save you time having to adjust your brake. It's interesting because you kind of take for granted how a bike goes together and everything. And then when it's up to you and there's no reference material or a bike shop right there or even a bike stand. Bike stands make everything that much easier. Like right now, standing on my bike in a weird way, I wouldn't do this in a bike stand. If I was doing this in a bike stand, I'd be oriented very differently with my bike. So that can create a level of confusion that you're not used to. Fortunately, I have never, for the number of bikes and people I've worked with who've traveled with SNS coupled bikes, I've never seen an insurance claim situation, which says a lot about how safe it is to travel with an SNS coupled bike. I've seen a number of people lose their bikes in a full bike case because the bike, when it's oversized, is taken to the far end of the airport in some special truck or whatever, and all the other luggage goes that direction. And it also shows up as a bike. For thieves, it makes it real obvious what to grab. These cases aren't that obvious. I have never seen one go missing in the case of theft or the airlines misplacing them, which I've seen lots of times with the regular big cases. Clean your chain before you travel and clean your chain before you come home so that it doesn't get everything gross and greasy. The lube I really like to use is rock and roll gold. It's a very clean lube. It cleans the chain as it loops. You saw how much I just dealt with my chain and my bike is continuously in dust, dirt, mud, that sort of thing. And my hands are barely dirty. I don't know if you can see my hands, but <laughs> they're barely dirty. And I didn't even wrap up the chain or anything. And, and I never do anything fancy with my chain in terms of cleaning it. You're gonna do better if you clean your bike. And it's really nice when your bike is in pieces because you can clean it in a way you cannot clean your bike when it's all together. I have never had to remove a crank set or a crank arm on a single bike, no matter how big the bike has been to pack. Uh, I do know people who remove crank sets and I believe they're traveling with the hard sided cases. I've packed some really big bikes and tricky setups that have a lot going on with them. Speaking of which, someone had a question about traveling with fenders. My preference for fender is the SKS longboard fenders. If you're gonna travel with them, you just wrap this around the wheel as well as you can. And that you know, it fits in the case, but I'm not gonna guarantee something bad isn't gonna happen to your fender. If you can get away with not traveling with fender, that's great. My two solutions to fenders are these. I use a very large saddlebag that has everything because I'm traveling and in some place without anyone who's going to come help me. But that works out really well as a rear fender. And something like this. This is the front fender and there's also the equivalent rear. It's very light. You can unclip these and you can fit that anywhere. You don't have to worry about breaking. Those are two good solutions. Plastic, yeah, the, the chromoplastic fenders are very strong and the aluminum fenders will fatigue, break, and, and will just scratch your bike up to pieces. It could be dangerous too, like sharp edges. When you're reaching in there, you might end up hurting yourself on that. What else will I pack in the case? Generally, water bottles, some clothes. If the clothes are in a cloth bag that keeps the clothes nice and clean, because those are light, and that's about it. That will get you pretty close to your 50 pound limit if that's all you have in there. I would never travel with a helmet in there because I think the helmet would get cracked. When you check into security, you just walk onto the plane with the helmet dangling off your backpack and that'll be fine. I've never heard of a problem doing that. Maybe your cycling shoes. It's important to have everything tethered together. You want to have things in bags. You want to have those bags tied around the bike, zip tied or taped together so that there's nothing that could just lose out. Like a cycling shoe. If you were to lose one of your cycling shoes, that might ruin your trip. It's not fun to think about all the things that could ruin your trip. It's not a bad exercise to go through the what ifs. And where are you traveling? Some people travel to places like California where there are 
gobs of bike shops and it's not a problem. So sure, travel with your hydraulic brake bike, no problem. A number of people are traveling to places that bike shops just don't exist. That's when you want to have everything under your control and take extra stuff, take extra brake pads. Maybe it's wet and muddy and gross. You need to be able to replace your brake pads. You'll have them with you. Take an extra chains or even an extra rotor. You don't have 160, 160. When you take an extra rotor, then you can replace either one of them. That can save your trip. Bring an extra set of cleats. I've seen mm. that numerous times where someone will have the cleat fall off their shoe. Well, that's a bummer. It's like losing a shoe. <laughs> having extras of everything is not a bad idea. Having extra bolts is also handy because you can lose a bolt. It's exciting. We just arrived in some really cool destination and the bike is almost ready to ride. And I've been doing this while being very distracted trying to talk through it all. Here's something to pay attention to when you go to put the cables back on your bike, especially if you're a mechanical shifting and mechanical brake bike, you're gonna have three of these and you'll have three cable stops on the frame. Now the cable stops will often be special where they're not, so it's easy to take this out and do things with it. In other words, separate it from the town tube, which is really handy. But getting it back, can be tricky. You wanna be careful because there's a ferrule at the end of the housing. You wanna make sure that's there, that that hasn't slipped down. And then you wanna set it in the proper cable stop. In order to ensure this, you can color code things. You can put a little piece of tape or a colored marker, a tester paint, that sort of thing. A dab here, a dab on the cable stop. You can put a dab down here and a dab on the one you are going to be coupling to and the cable stop that it's going into. If you do that with all three, you don't have to worry about making a mistake. You'll figure it out eventually, but it can be a bit frustrating when you're connecting the wrong cables. And we're wondering why the cables aren't connecting. That's another something that happens. The number one reason why cables aren't connecting is because you're connecting the rear brake and the rear brake has a spring in it. So you've got to yank on that. You've got to yank kind of hard in order to get that cable long enough to connect. You yank on it, that connects, and that screws in together, nice and tight. Using your fingers, don't use tools because we use tools. Well, it's fine to use tools. As long as your tools are traveling with you, then you'll be able to get it apart. If that's loose, it probably means that a ferrule is not seated or it's not in the cable stop. And if it's still too tight, it's probably because the housing got held up and is not seated properly, completely in the cable stop. So there's a lot of little things that could go on there that make that not come together exactly as it should. And if this cable is loose, it's gonna be harder to tighten this because the frame's not together enough. It should go together perfectly and it should still shift the exact same way it shifted before you packed your bike. Um, and it should break the same way it was breaking before you packed your bike. So once you get that connected, you wanna pick your wheel up, you wanna spin it, make sure it's spinning freely, make sure there's no anything dragging. If it's dragging, you need to adjust your brake. So you know how to do that. Same thing for, with the front. And you wanna do a brake check. You wanna feel how those brakes feel. And then if you can, spin the rear derailleur to make sure it works. Obviously, I don't have the battery in here. If you're an electronic bike, bring all the batteries the bike needs. If you've got a power meter on your bike, you need those batteries. You've got a SRAM Axis ETAP bike. There are batteries in the levers. If you're a DI2 12 speed bike, you've got batteries in the levers. These are CR2032s, which is the same battery as you would use in a cork power meter. CR2032s are really handy batteries to have. If you have hydraulic levers, you need a quarter. So in my pile of parts here, of tools, I've got a quarter. If you have hydraulic levers, you need a quarter. On the non-hydraulic levers that have cable, on the SRAM Force Axis ETAP levers, you need a small Phillips head screwdriver. Just change the batteries before you travel. But there is nothing saying that something isn't going to drain your battery. If something pushes in on your lever, it can drain the battery. Bring extras and bring all the things you need to replace those. And bring the chargers. Bring the charger for your bike. We're almost there. 
You just have to put on the pedals, the chain's off, which is fine. Get the chain back on there. You wanna make sure the chain is still on the jockey wheels. You'll know it pretty quick because there's gonna be some loud noise. The number one thing, if your bike's making noise, don't ride it. Figure out what's wrong before you ride it. Your bike should not make any new unusual noises, nor should you travel with a bike that's starting with any noise. So any noises, investigate it because something's probably not right and it could be a problem. I use the mechanical brakes instead of hydraulic brakes because I do not want to have to worry about a broken hydraulic line or getting an air bubble in the line. If everything goes right, you shouldn't just get an air bubble in a hydraulic line. But it has happened and hydraulic lines can be severed. And then you have to find a bike shop in order to fix that. There's very, very few people who could service that on their own without a new length of housing, more hydraulic fluid, which you can't travel with because it's caustic. I don't want caustic fluid all over all my stuff. And I've found that the brake power from the cable actuated disc brakes is great. I've been really pleased with it. I've got these disc brakes on a lot of people's bikes who are heavier than I am, who are stronger riders, who descend faster and need more brake power. I don't think cable actuated disc brakes are a problem and there are good options on the market. I've done a bunch of bike packing and things off the grid where I just can imagine some of the things that could go wrong, and I've certainly seen things go wrong with hydraulic brakes. So I try to just minimize the opportunity for a problem. That's how I've set up my bike and, and how I travel. Just try to keep those to a minimum. Put in the battery, take out the door, take the door off the battery, which you put on there so you can see a black battery amongst a whole bunch of black cycling clothes or anything else. There we go, I see the green light. This is something anyone can do. You do not have to be a bike mechanic to couple and decouple an SNS coupled bike. All of this feels a little weird. It's especially weird if you've gotten to know your beloved bike as a whole bike and then you decouple it and your bike's in two pieces. It feels a little unnatural and that can be hard psychologically just to see your bike in pieces. You get over that, you practice it and then you realize how much you can do with your bike. Anytime you want to take it, you take it on a business trip, ride it on the weekend. You only have to get one good ride with your bike to have made it entirely worth bringing it with you on the trip, the price of the couplers, all of it. I've taken the bike to places like Warsaw, for example. Tiny little cabs. My husband and I went there together and we went with a couple tandem, which was really cool riding around the city of Warsaw and driving around in the cabs there was terrible. It's not a lot of fun, but it's really fun on a bike. So we've had a lot of amazing experiences because of the couplers. I've had a lot of people come to me for a travel bike and I get emails later saying, wow, this bike is my A bike. This is the bike I do everything with and on. So I think that surprises a lot of people that your travel bike can be your everything bike and is amazing.